Hello, welcome along to the Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name's Dan, thanks for listening. This week, it's an ecology special. We're being supported by the British Ecological Society to learn all about what ecology is and how it helps us and how it affects what we do and the world that we live in every day. We'll chat to a proper ecological expert in just a sec who will explain it all. He'll go through the whole thing for us. Uh, Basically, ecology is looking at how living things affect each other. Whether human, animal or plant life, they all affect the balance of the ecosystem around us. It's also about the weather, changes to the planet, pollution and even pandemics and about how all of those affect the world too. It's about finding out how living things and the environment work together. Now one of the most important ecological issues right now is to do with climate change. So let's start off there. Let's hear from one of our favourite experts from Fun Kids HQ on this to tell us more. Here's Marina Ventura. Marina Ventura's Climate Explorers. Hi there, Marina Ventura here. I love finding out about the natural world, and that includes the Earth's climate. We know that weather can change from one day to the next, but climates can change too over the time span of years, centuries, or even longer. So, I'm on a mission to fill MapApp with the latest climate information with the help of some awesome climate explorers. Come on then, let's go! Earth is very old, four and a half billion years old in fact. It can be really hard to get your head around such a big number, especially as humans have only been around for a tiny amount of that time. That said, I bet you know a bit about how life on Earth has changed. Here's a clue. You know about dinosaurs, right? Luckily, we don't need to worry about them anymore. Well, just as types of life on Earth have changed over time, so has the global climate. Come on, let's find out what's behind those changes. You've already hit on one thing behind changes, Marina. Types of life can affect the climate. When the Earth was very young, even though there wasn't as much heat coming from the sun, the planet was very hot and gassy. And that's because there weren't any plants to absorb these gases. These gases acted a bit like a blanket and stopped the heat escaping, so air temperatures went up. As life on Earth developed, plants evolved and grew in number. As they were able to absorb gases like carbon dioxide, they helped reduce the blanket effect and cooled temperatures down. And temperatures cooled down. For the last few million years, the sun has been causing climates to change. Stars like the sun get hotter as they age, and today the Earth gets more heat from the sun than it did when life was starting to develop on our planet. And the sun itself is always changing. Giant dark spots called sunspots are always moving across its surface, causing the sun to give off slightly more energy, which makes the Earth a bit warmer. So what else makes climates naturally change? Well, something else that comes in cycles is all to do with the Earth's orbit, the way it moves around the sun. The shape of the orbit changes gradually from a circle to more of an oval in a cycle that lasts about a 100,000 years. This makes the Earth move further away from the Sun at times, so less of the Sun's energy reaches the planet. The Earth also tilts as it orbits, and that tilt can be bigger at some times than others. This means that parts of the Earth become closer to the Sun, and so hotter in summer, and others are further away, and so colder in winter. So naturally there will be cycles of different climates as the Earth's orbit changes, and as the energy the planet gets from the Sun varies, as well as what kind of plants and animals are living. These are all reasons why the climate has naturally changed and will continue to do so. But don't forget there are things which can affect climates which aren't related to our orbit of the sun. Remember the dinosaurs! Good point, Mappy. You'll probably know that scientists believe the dinosaurs died out because a giant meteorite crashed into the Earth. The meteorite caused a dust cloud which blocked out the sun, causing temperatures to drop many living things on Earth died. Something similar happens when volcanoes erupt. Clouds of ash can fill the skies, sometimes for many years, blocking out sunlight and causing global temperatures to drop. 
Scientists have noticed that in the last hundred years or so, the climate has changed in other unexpected ways. Whilst we are in the middle of a naturally warmer part of the cycle, temperatures have risen much more quickly than they have before. This is because of the effect that humans have on the environment, and it's something we'll be finding out more about. That's right, all with the help of some real-life climate explorers. Come on, Marina, load me up. Good job, Mappy. See you soon, everyone. Marina Ventura's Climate Explorers, supported by the Natural Environment Research Council, the science of the natural world. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash marina. Now, here's the deal with this, right? We're doing two ecology specials, one now this week, the one that you're listening to. We'll also do one in a few weeks' time. So ahead of that one, I'd love some more of your science questions, by the way. Uh, they can be ecology-themed, if you fancy, if you've got any questions about the way that the world works, how animals, humans and plants interact with each other on the planet, uh, if, you, if you're wondering how lockdown is affecting the ecosystem, maybe you're curious about climate change, uh, let me know your question and I will do my best to figure out the answer. The way that you do that is by leaving it as a review over on Apple Podcasts. That is what Will J has done. Hey, Will. Also, hello to Jaden, to Flan Doodle, to Poodle Face Snake. I mean, as you can see, your names on Apple Podcasts, they can be extremely silly. I don't mind what you call yourself. I just want to know your name. You need to leave it there. Also, drop us five stars because that will help me see it. And there's a little comment box at the bottom. That is where you write your review. Head to the Apple Podcast Store, find the Fun Kids Science Weekly, and let me know your science question. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. It's one of our ecology specials and hoping to, to bring it to life for us. And let us know a little bit more about the world of ecology. We've got Dr. Yosef Araya on the phone. He's a member of the British Ecological Society. Hey, Yosef. Hello, Dan. Well, I think we'll start. What type of things do ecologists learn about generally? What's the general field of study? Uh, ecologists come in various uh, roles. In fact, you might think of an ecologist as someone who is studying about the living side of uh, things on our planet. So they could be studying plants, they could be studying animals, they could be studying fungi, and they study it how it relates to the overall environment. In fact, pretty much anyone who is working on the interface between Earth and its living things can be called an ecologist. So you may have a farmer who can be an agroecologist, and you may have uh, someone in the jungles of the, the tropics looking at uh, monkeys in the treetops. Or you can have a microbial ecologist who is looking at how little bugs make our grass grow greener, for example. So they can be various roles for them. So it's hugely varied there, Yosef. It seems to be work that is very much to, centered on what's happening now. How much can we learn about the future and how the world might look in the future when we study ecology? Well, understanding the interrelationships is actually very, very helpful for our future plans. It's just like that if you know how the grass, let's take a, premier, a premiership football pitch, grows, it might help you to understand how it might change. It might uh, be when it gets too warm or when it is a dry summer. So it's very much useful understanding it in the short term, but also in the very long term. If you think about it, what would happen if our uh, climate gets warmer in the coming hundred years or so? So it's very much about, it's just like history. It's not only learning from the past, but also learning to look forward into the future and be ready for it. And you've spoken to us just a second ago about all the different kinds of ecologists that there are. What are the, the skills that almost all of them have? What do, what, do, what do ecologists have in common? Ecologists tend to have uh, generally the curiosity to observe and to look at things. And most ecologists, you will find out, end up exploring things outside, uh, whether it is in their own local environment. I know ecologists working at the grasslands in the UK, which is as rich as some of the tropical rainforests in Amazonia. So ecologists uh, can be working on different sides of uh, organisms and different types of uh, 
scales, whether it is local or global, or some ecologists actually study things in the past as well. They can be what we call paleoecologists. Think of them like archaeologists type ecologists who study what people ate in the past and what new crops can we get in the future. And what's your path towards ecology been there, Yosef? Oh, my path has been uh, a bit more accidental. I was always in interested in nature, but I never thought I would put it into a career. Uh, so what happened was, uh, when I went to university, I watched uh, David Attenborough's um, life of, Private Life of Plants. And I was hooked because I never thought plants could be that ingenious, that they are, they have feelings, they interact with organisms and they can deceive, they can grow in the deserts. And I was thinking like, if they have this, all these adaptations, how can I make a contribution to understand to the future? In fact, my basic interest had been how to understand our food production system so that we have enough and good amounts to feed the whole world. So I started out with a pretty much self-interest of looking at how to produce food and now I understand it's much bigger and one, I need to understand the whole world, how things live together, how biodiverse things are, if I am to make sure that I have a contribution to make. That's quite wide, Joseph. It's fantastic. But getting more specific for the future mm -hmm. for you, what things would you really like to figure out in terms of ecology and the way the world works as you go on with your learning and your studying and being a doctor? One of the fascinating people I have always appreciated is uh, obviously um, Alexander von Humboldt. Uh, he is like the person who inspired Charles Darwin here. What he was interested in was how do all sorts of different living things manage to coexist together, like making their living what you can call in the economy of nature. For example, if you have a big city, you have people doing different professions and trying to survive and make a living. In that case, our rich biodiversity of living things, they manage to coexist. Like in a field, you might see grass just being green, but actually, if you look closely, there can be, let's say, 20 or 30 types of grass living in just one meter square, basically on the tabletop. And how do they live together? What can we learn from them? And it's a great mystery and ecologists have been looking at it and uh, I'm very keen to, for example, how do you promote one if you want to grow a specific crop? Do you change the water or do you apply fertilizer? Or how do you make it full of wildflowers? So I'm interested to know how they live and then how we can manage them, especially in a sustainable way, so that we can enjoy them not only now, but also for future generations. So my interest has been on the key things, what makes coexistence and what makes sustainability. And sustainability particularly is so important as we, we kind of move through with the current climate crisis and, and getting on with our overpopulated planet. Dr. Yosef Arai, thank you so much for joining us. You're most welcome. Now, in this week's Dangerous Dan, you can hear how cow farts are changing the planet. Before that, here's some very quick ecology to think about. Now, we've heard how ecology is, is all about how humans and animals and plants affect the balance of the world. And it's really important to remember that we're a part of that. I mean, humans aren't in charge of the natural world. It's all we are. We're just a part of the whole thing, part of a whole big picture. Uh, I guess an easy way. Imagine um, the world is a big chessboard. We aren't playing the game. We don't move the pieces. Instead, humans are one of the pieces. And what we do affects all the other pieces too. Uh, it might make you feel small in a way, but think about it. It's pretty amazing. Because what you do every day affects so much that you don't see. Think about how important you are. And the life cycle of everything on Earth is pretty epic too. I mean, the molecules in your body might end up one day becoming a flower or a bird of prey or a huge tree. It just goes round and round and round. And that's what humans are. We're part of that whole cycle. It's time for this week's Dangerous Dan, which is about something disgusting 
and also pretty deadly to the planet. You see, cow farts are harming the whole world. They are thought to be one of the main contributing factors to the rising global temperature because of what cows eat and how they digest their food in their bellies as well. Their farts, and particularly their burps, they hold a lot of methane. Now, you all have heard that carbon dioxide, right? We're always talking about carbon dioxide on the show. Carbon dioxide is one of the main causes of trapping heat in the planet. But here's the thing, methane is much worse. It is 25 times more powerful than CO2 in trapping heat in the planet. Now, 14% of all greenhouse emissions from human activity is from the methane that cows let off. And we are hugely responsible for that because if we didn't farm as many cows as we do across the planet, there would clearly be fewer cow farts letting off this harmful gas. That gas traps heat on the planet and it heats it up massively as well, which is one of the main factors for climate change. Echo Gecko is brought to you by Fun Kids with the British Ecological Society, advancing ecology and making it count. Mm. Hello, I'm Echo Gecko, a lizard who loves ecology. Ecology is about studying the plants and animals around us and seeing how we are connected. Why don't you join me as we find out more? Today I'm swimming around coral reefs in the balmy waters of the Red Sea, near Egypt. Coral reefs occur in many parts of the world where the waters are shallow and warm. And whilst they only make up about 1% of the ocean floor, they're home to nearly a quarter of all life in the ocean. Coral reefs might look like massive rocky structures, but they're actually alive. It's thanks to the coral polyps, small marine animals that create limestone shells around themselves. These shells build up to make the reefs, which in turn are home for a huge variety of marine life. Let's take a closer look. Wow! Up close, the different types of coral look like a multicoloured limestone jungle. The polyps wave their tentacles out of the limestone to catch microscopic zooplankton to eat. And they get extra energy from clever plants called zooxanthellae that actually grow inside the polyps. Algae, shellfish, crustaceans such as crabs and plankton live on and around the reefs. And they make a great meal for all the fish. Here comes a shimmering shawl now. Wow, clownfish! You'd recognise these anywhere. Bright orange with stripes, very bright and colourful. The reefs are home to fish in all colours of the rainbow and in an amazing array of shapes and sizes. They are often very slim so they can hide from predators like sharks in the craggy gaps. Reef fish aren't very fast but they're incredibly nimble, like the mandarin fish which has large pectoral fins which help him go backwards in small spaces. Handy if you need to make a quick escape. Uh oh, why are they scampered off? Let's get out of here. I don't think we want to meet whatever they're hiding from. Eco Bite. Closer to home, you can see ecology in action in your garden. Why not look out at dusk for these unusual visitors? <laughs> That's a bat. Pipistrelle bats are tiny with reddish brown coats and blackish brown ears, nose, and wing membranes. They emerge in the evenings to feed for a couple of hours before returning to their roosts. Is that a snake? No, it's a slow worm. With their long, smooth, shiny and grey or brown bodies, slow worms look like tiny snakes. In fact, they are legless lizards and are quite harmless. They like humid conditions and they emerge from their hiding places at dusk or after rain to hunt for food. Over the winter, they'll hibernate under piles of leaves or within tree roots. Join us again next time when we find out more about ecology on Fun Kids. Echo Gecko is brought to you by Fun Kids with the British Ecological Society, advancing ecology and making it count. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Now, we've spoken about a lot of ecology in these last specials. Uh, And now we're thinking about our place in the world because we are humans. We're at the top of kind of our food chain, really. But there's a lot of other creatures that are out there and we impact on them a lot. So to help explain that and to try and get our head around it is Dr. Dan Foreman. He's on the line. He's a member of the British Ecological Society. He lectures biosciences at Swansea University. He is the dude for the job. Hey, Dan. Hey, how you doing? Good to, good to speak to you. Very well, thank you. So thank you so much for joining us. Now, I said there that humans are 
uh, kind of top of our part of the food chain, aren't we, really? Um, but we need to pay more attention to our place in the world. So can you just try and expand on that, try and run through all the different species that are around us and maybe how we affect these creatures? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the world is an amazing place and we're, we're really lucky to see such wonderful biodiversity. That's what we call the diversity of life on this planet. And all life on this planet exists to exist. Uh, and it's a wonderful thing to see. We're part of that, uh, part of this evolutionary continuum as well of constant adaption and change as nature tries to come up with new blueprints for animals and plants and fungi that can adapt and survive better in conditions. Um, Unfortunately, we humans are a very large impact on the natural environment, largely because there's so many of us. If you consider in 1900, there was maybe 1.6 billion human beings a day. We're, we're pushing 7 billion now. So you can't help but have a, an impact on the natural environment around you, be that through just building uh, urban structures, factories, housing, but also the supply chains, the networks that connect us all as well, and agriculture, which takes up a phenomenal amount of land as well. So we encroach upon nature very, very frequently and as a consequence of our population size. Now, this, this is all very well, but uh, for humans, it, it, we, we're very fortunate to be humans and have this awareness of the world around us. But there are many forms of life on this planet that actually fulfill very, very important um, functions that we benefit from. And scientists often call these things ecosystem functions, ecosystem benefits, things that actually allow us to survive. And, and it's pretty obvious when you think about it. So oxygen, I, I think most of us will agree that oxygen is pretty important. Uh, and without plants, we would have no oxygen. So it, it's a very well-known thing, but it still emphasizes the importance of this. If we want to eat food, certain types of food, we need certain types of insects that actually pollinate the, those particular crops so we can actually eat them. So these things, if we affect them, they're actually affecting us as well. And that isn't the only reason why we should care for the planet and all this wondrous biodiversity around us. There are many reasons why we should look after it. If you consider that uh, a lot of nature inspires us both in music, art, literature, history, that, that there are so many uh, things that are enriched by an understanding of nature. And I think being an ecologist really allows you to see that and understand your place in things. The best analogy I can give you is the world really is a chessboard and, and humans really do think that we're the players behind it. We're making all of the moves and everything follows the dictates that we do. But in reality, we're actually one of the pieces on the chessboard. And I think we're analogous to the queen. We're very powerful. We can move around a lot. But let's not forget that we are in a place with other things and they can interact. And if you know your chess, then you know that the, the, the very mighty queen can be taken by the lowly pawn. So we have to understand that we are in this system and we need to look after ourselves and the world around us if we want everything to flourish and for humans to have health, wealth and prosperity. Now, humans have worked very hard, though, to become the queen of this chessboard. Say, for instance, here's a, here's a situation that might never happen or at the moment, actually, with the way things are going, possibly could. Imagine if the queen was toppled, Dan, right? Imagine if humans weren't around. Um, what what would the landscape be like, do you think, as someone who's studied ecology? How well would all these creatures interact with each other? Or do humans play quite an important part in keeping other creatures in check? Oh, we, we certainly do, just by our very presence. We, we manage populations of lots of different things uh, for our benefit and also to reduce uh, problems such as disease, which, which is a very important topic at the moment, as I'm sure everyone's aware of. So without humans, it, it, it's, it's very clear from our understanding about how quickly nature responds to gaps and opportunities. Uh, it's very likely that, that the signs of civilization would disappear very, very quickly indeed over a matter of a few hundred years. Uh, and nature would, would sort of come in and occupy this vacant landscape that we had dominated for so many uh, centuries and that, uh, hundreds of years. So I think it's quite a fascinating thing to think about, but obviously we don't want that type of dystopian future. What we want really is to understand how best to, to live on this planet and live uh, in a, with a closer connection to nature so we can best all benefit. And, and it's, not just, um, it's not just us and animals that are uh, having an impact. You mentioned earlier about diseases. Now, 
we've got to think of the grand eco um, ecosystem and the, the the grand biodiversity that's out there. And viruses are part of that, aren't they? Viruses have a purpose. They they act as as, as many creatures do in that they, it's their fight to survive. How big a part do they have to play in the biodiversity of the entire planet? Well, they're extremely numerous, and we, we, the, the problem being is it's actually very, very hard to count the number of viruses. Uh, and if you want to go even lower than that, there's a, there's a wonderful group called prions as well. But uh, th- th- there are a bewildering number of them, and humans have co-evolved with these viruses through evolutionary time, believe it or not. Uh, and we've been exposed to viruses throughout all of our evolutionary history, but particularly so when we started leaving trees and sort of being this bipedal animal that moved around and started to socialize that was really when we started to experience uh, encountering a lot of these uh, very amazing organisms whilst they are unpleasant to us and do occasionally cause significant harm to us uh, there are many things out there that have very very important ecological functions and uh, viruses are part of our system whether we like it or not they are there and uh, they're to be respected as part of nature and ecology is also really powerful in, in helping us not just understand our place in the world, but also understanding how to improve, coming up with solutions to problem, um, problems, Dan. Can you just tell us a bit more about that, about how we can actually learn from creatures and from nature around us to maybe help our own situation? Well, I think a lot of it is learning how to live with nature and how to reduce the, the impact that such a large number of humans actually have on the planet. That, that's really one of the greatest challenges that we have. Uh, looking at the example of disease, one of the things we can do is understand the processes and the situations that we can help facilitate that they actually encourage diseases to come into human populations. So um, you may not be aware that habitat loss and destruction can actually cause us to encounter Uh, what we call pathogens, dangerous organisms that can infect us. So actually changing the environment, destroying habitats, actually changes the dynamics of the world around us. And this can lead in some very unfortunate circumstances to the emergence or the re-emergence of certain diseases, which can have a profound impact on human society, such as at the current time with COVID-19. And if you think, if, if you were to say that perhaps humans have overstepped the mark in how we are interacting with biodiversity uh, that perhaps we are we do see ourselves as being in charge of nature rather than as you say trying to work with nature Uh, as someone that studies ecology dan how would you suggest humans keep themselves in check more what are the first stages that we need to do to um get on better with the world around us Well, I think it's really important to recognise that we all have a role to play. Uh, Not everyone needs to be an ecologist, not everyone needs to be a politician and change the world, but we can all make very little uh, simple changes to our life. In terms of using less water, considering where we buy our food from, is is it locally sourced? Those things have a huge impact if everyone does them, and that obviously will have uh, profound impacts on the amount of oil and petrol that we consume, which also is fueling the the, the climate change uh, issue that we've got at the moment as well so just looking at the simple choices we can make as individuals i think it's very empowering to know that we can make differences we can make change and indeed a lot of people are as well and i think that's really important to remember it's not all doom and gloom far from it ecology is a subject which embraces the opportunity really to try to help society understand what is best for humanity, what is best for the planet. And by working in partnership with lots of other different subject areas, uh, ecology is actually able to do this. And in the sense of diseases at the moment, uh, there's this concept called One Health, which is the integration of medicine, uh, veterinary sciences, but also ecology as well. So we can all work in partnership to understand the processes by which diseases emerge, how to tackle them, and how to avoid creating the situations that actually spark these events in the first place. So there's a lot of goodness to take away from this. And I call upon everyone, get involved, understand ecology. You don't need to be an ecologist, but you need to recognize that everything we do has an impact on things around us. And sometimes that's good, And sometimes that's bad. And when it's uh, bad, we need to work together to find solutions. Amazing. Dr. Dan Foreman, thank you so much for for telling us all about our place in the world. It's been a real treat. You're welcome. It's been great to speak to you, Dan. 
Right, let's finish off this episode with some incredible ecology facts. Did you know plants on the surface of the Earth have existed for around 400 million years? Also, cows and horses can sleep standing up. Even though polar bears look white, that's just their fur. Underneath, their skin is pitch black. Now, dogs have two air passages. One is for breathing, the other is for smelling, which means they can kind of sniff and breathe out at the same time. Also, cats don't have collarbones, which is why they're so bendy. And finally, ostriches can run faster than horses and can roar louder than lions. And that is it for our first Fun Kids Science Weekly Ecology Special. They are supported by the British Ecological Society. You can find out more about ecology over at www.britishecologicalsociety.org. We'll have another one in a couple of weeks' time, learning more about the part that humans have to play in the way that us humans and animals and plant life interact with each other around the world and how we all fit into this ecosystem. Now, if you've got a science question uh, that you want answered on the show, you need to leave it for us as a review over on Apple Podcasts. Type Fun Kids Science Weekly in there, it will come up leave a review that's where you put your question while you're on apple as well it's one of the brilliant places that you can hear all of the science series that we've done all of our podcasts uh, you can hear them on there you can also hear them wherever you normally listen to your shows they're on spotify they're on google you can also get them on the free fun kids app and at funkidslive.com and fun kids are a children's radio station from the uk you can hear us all over the country on your dab digital radio and at funkidslive.com 